Hello, everyone, and welcome to Moto America's new feature we call 21 in 21. The AMA Superbike class has been going on since 1976. And in that time, we've had a total of 21 national champions. And we're lucky enough to have the very first Superbike champion for the first three years of competition, Reg Pridmore. Hey, Reg, how are you? Good, Greg. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing really well. Reg, you and I have known each other now getting close to 25 years. And one of the things we wanted to talk with you about, of course, was Superbike and what Superbike was like back in the day when you raced it. It was a brand new class, I believe, the first year that you won the championship. Yes. So let's get right into it, Reg. Like, how was Superbike back then when it first started? We actually started talking Superbike before it really was. Um, I mentioned that way back in 74, 75, things were moving up. Bikes were getting faster and a lot of bikes were having trouble with handling. And it was a pretty exciting time, really, because we couldn't manage the power so much. But it was one of those things where we were able to put our own abilities into it more so and make it work. Did you think back then that Superbike would be as big of a phenomenon as it is today? Coming from England and seeing what they did with, with the street classes that they had even way back when we talk about 50s and 60s, um, I envisioned it to grow pretty well, but I didn't realize it would get as big as it is now. So tell me about those first few years, the motorcycles that you were on and some of the tracks that you were racing on. Oh, uh, there's a lot of words attached to that one. Um, I started mainly with the BMWs when it was around 74, 75. We, uh, we had machinery that was capable, we thought. And club racing moved into professional pretty easily. But when it came to the different tracks than that, the BMW was sort of superior in its handling compared to a lot of the things I was running against. A lot of the brands were always complaining about what the front end's doing and what the back end is doing. And it got to a point where you couldn't convince people that it could get better if they just left it alone. But I wasn't into teaching. I was into helping. And basically, I worked through a few of those bikes where people came back and showed good signs of becoming a, a champion. And I remember Cooks, Cook Nelson in 77, Daytona. Brilliant. Great job. Well planned. Did a wonderful job. And um, although I won the championship that year, we didn't quite exceed the top end that we really wanted, but it was uh, it was pretty close. But I like, in, I like consistency, uh, Greg. If you do things repetitively to the point where they become a part of you, things develop and get better sooner. And that's what I had to do. I had to try that with the Kawasaki's in 77 and 78, up to 79 until I had a pretty bad accident or somebody caused a really bad accident for me at Laguna Sega. But all of the tracks that you talk about, we didn't have many championship races i think only four or five but the tracks grew and the popularity grew and naturally boy worldwide now it's just pitching to watch as far as the bikes the ability of the guys to make those things get around the corner and of course they're not on those hockey parks that we used to race on they were guaranteed to uh, wake up your day and in the rain, yeah, they became pretty tough. But nowadays, beautiful tires, bitching tires, much better handling, good power, and it just goes on and on. You know the story. Yeah, for sure. So tell me, what impact has motorcycling had in your life after racing? From when it started, when I was 15, it was a long time ago, and it's never let me down since. All I've ever done has been around motorcycles. In the biggest part of my life, that and flying, um, those two come together pretty naturally. But it come down to the point where winning championships at that time had a lot of fun attached to it. 
the seriousness of today with the big monies and so forth changed the scene a bit as far as I'm concerned. But the guys are riding hard and ferociously and and uh I think motorcycling being such a big part of my life has captured things like that picture behind me, flying F-16s and and flying the uh, the simulator of the SR-71. I mean, bigger things in life don't come, <laughs> um, other than getting married, of course. Don't forget that one. <laughs> So tell me more about uh, you and teaching. When did you start to teach, and are you still doing it today? Yeah, we have schools this year. In fact, it's, it blows my mind that, that the schools are filling months and months ahead of the time, which is good. But I have knocked it back from 15 last year to 10 this year, possibly 10 this year. Um, Gigi was scared to death from a certain person that tried to impress her uh, prior to knowing Reg Primor. And when we got together, she got to mm. like bikes enough, and I can't say enough about her development. On a scale of 1 to 10, she's pretty close to 9 and 10 on a 1,000 RRs. You, some guys come in and say, what did you do that for? What did, you t- well, what did she want to? That was it. That was a great part. And she's one of my best right hands I could ever possibly want. Well, I can tell you this, Reg, from my perspective, I started being influenced by your teaching and your riding all the way back in 1997. And I may not be as fast as I was at one point, but the foundation and the fundamentals that you taught me back then, I still apply every single time I get on a motorcycle, whether it's on the street or on the road. I mean, over the years, how many people's lives do you think that you've provided tools for that make them better, safer riders over the years? Great question, Greg, and I can sum it up fairly easily because, yeah, I was an old racer. I really enjoy the fact that people are willing to learn if they listen and they listen well. It can accomplish points right up to saving your lives. I don't teach racing at the track. I teach people how to be better, more confident, more control, more technique. And understand that the bike is your best friend to the point where it will do things for you now if you learn it to the point where you'll want to come back. You'll want to do more of this. You'll want to ride more. Um, that's what I've accomplished. And I do get the occasional letter where it says, thanks, Reg, you saved my life. That's pretty, uh, how can I say, it? that's pretty good for me to hear that coming from people that I never really knew prior to them coming to school. And as far as that goes, too, we have so many repeats, which makes it really good for us that they sign up early. And uh, I got into teaching the police officers about five years ago, and now we can't mm-hmm. do enough for that. We usually acquire about 60 riders a day on that one. And sorting out the bad boys, they're good. They're really good. And they know what they're doing on a scale of 1 to 10. They, they push the envelope right to 5, 6, and 7. But when you start opening up what 8, 9, and 10 can do for you, I think it helps them become more acquainted with what motorcycling is all about. It can be very safe. You just have to make it safe. Yeah, very true. Well, thank you, Reg, for being a part of my life. and getting me to a level of competency that allowed me to have a small career in AMA superbike racing, but obviously now, you know, in television. Um, And really, thank you for spending time with us. And the one thing you'll always have is that in superbike racing, which now is all around the world, you were the first national champion in the United States and did it three times in a row. So thanks for joining us. And as always, congratulations to those championships. Well, thanks a lot, Greg. It's nice of you to say that you picked up as much as you did because uh, it was a busy time even then in life with bike development, meeting nice people, and uh, I appreciate your friendship. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me on the show today. I appreciate that. Thanks. 